Hi, welcome to the Stitch TV show. I'm Lynn. And I'm Pam. We're happy you're joining us today. The Stitch is an online quilting talk show, the perfect soundtrack for your sewing room. Join us for twice monthly talk shows, virtual stitch-ins, celebrity interviews, and podcasts. You can learn more at thestitchtvshow.com. Our show today is brought to you by Ink and Arrow Fabrics, a division of QT Fabrics. Very excited to announce that finally, after weeks of staring at the Pixie Dots bundle in front of us. They're going to go away. We are going to do a giveaway. So, to enter the giveaway, go to our website, stitchtvshow.com, enter using the raffle copter entry before November 23rd, 2017. If you're watching this after November 23rd, 2017, the giveaway is closed, unfortunately. But, uh, we will ship internationally. It may not come in this precise uh, bundle configuration, given the box we can find to fit them in. <laughs> but they will not have little bits cut out of them or anything. No. You will get the full bundle. So yes. thank you, Ink and Arrow, for providing that. And look for that, again, on the website. <gasps> and also, thank you to Famore Cutlery for sponsoring this episode. They are a maker of specialty scissors, shears, and crafting tools. And once again, we are delighted to showcase the shears and snips fancy multicolored snips here that I can't Ooh, touch. Oh, I know. Yes. Those new, are nice. New in box, as we say <laughs> in the trade. <laughs> I love, I actually own those and um, use them all the time myself. Ooh. These are my two favorite little Fomori products. Yes. So. Whoa. And I like that they're cool colored. Yeah. Very fancy. 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 <laughs> Pinky up fancy. All righty. So today we're going to be talking about non-traditional um, mindful crafting. So this is a little bit different than what we're used to seeing yes. when we talk about crafting. And we're also going to be talking about the differences between ironing and pressing. Hmm. Are there differences? We will find out. So tell me what yes. you've been up to. Well... And exciting news. <gasps> Finally, so I signed up for this thing this like thing? a year ago. And frankly, it is the uh, In My Neighborhood Row Along run by Quilter Chick. Or okay. She, okay. C -H -I -C. Oh, this is what you were working That's on. That's what I was working on the virtual stitch yeah. show in October. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which for us was just last night, but for you guys, that was like a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, how this works. <laughs> how that works. How this whole wormhole works. <laughs> exactly. So uh, it was a group of, I think, 11 designers that each designed a different row with the theme of things you would find in your neighborhood. And it was interesting because not everyone presented their ideas up front. So you never knew, like, what someone else was going to post. And I had, like, two different ideas that then other people posted. I'm like, oh, dang it. <laughs> so then I had to go up with a third idea. And your idea was? <gasps> I, I think my idea will be out probably the week after this episode drops. Oh, so we can't tell. Oh, I don't think it matters. They saw it on the virtual stitching. Oh, okay. So I uh, wanted to do something around pets because that's something that we both have. And exactly. So I did little dog houses and then little bird feeders <laughs> because cats don't really have houses other than like your entire house. <laughs> and that felt a little ambitious for a six inch row. <laughs> Does feel a little. So I did bird feeders, uh, and then I applica I fussy cut or brewery per se in Bird fancy terms, uh, some little animals from a novelty fabric to put oh, with that is the dog house. Per se. See, look at me being fancy. You are. I was like, that's not necessarily. But now you're explaining yes, it. it totally she's is. right. It is totally because is. I, you know, I could have done a generic outline of a cat or a dog, but I thought, yeah, let me give a little personality. So I, uh, I'm the, I think I'm the last row, and then the last month is kind of the how to put it together and layout. And the challenge that I had, too, with my row, I wanted to make it so it would work either uh, horizontally or vertically. Right. Because these rows are kind of all different heights. They're anywhere from six to nine inches tall. Ooh. And so, you like, you don't need just a super long quilt that's only 48 inches wide. That's true. <laughs> so we needed some vertical rows to go in there. So mine can be arranged either way to help. Fill in whatever gap you need. Do you think that the row by row program throughout the the one that happens in the, the well in the mostly summer. in the U.S. but yeah, yeah in the mostly summer. in the U.S. I started to say I thought it was international, but it wasn't there. For sure. There are some in Europe and Canada. But the row by row, do you think that's like had people more interested in making row quilts and making more row quilts? Probably because it's yeah. It, typically, you think round robin, so you're 
additions go, go around, around the center medallion. Vanilla row, yeah. But, not, and, but I have seen row alongs now. Yes. Which makes me think of the nursery rhyme, but... Row, row, row your boat? Yeah. Yeah. With your quilt, apparently. <laughs> I don't know. I just have seen them become more popular than I think yeah. you've seen in well, a Well, I think it's a good way to do, like, a modular design. And the trick that you have then is, like, all right, do these all fit together thematically? And that's... Some of the row by rows don't. Well, everyone has a theme, but each shop takes inspiration from that theme and designs something different. Right. And And they can be be very contrasting. Wildly different. Wildly different. (laughs) Because you're mixing piecing, applique. Some even have. A lot of them are applique heavy, I think. Yeah. Those row by rows. Yeah. So. And that's, I've not yet done a row by row quilt. I think part of that is because I want to have a little more control. And I. I don't like road trips, frankly. I don't like being in the car. And so I'm not inclined to like hop in the car and tour all the quilt shops and get all the rows just to do the, you know, the challenge to like finish your quilt and show it and then get 20 feet front quarters or whatever the prize is. Right. Exactly. So I, I like to have a little more control, but I've seen some rows that I really like that I'm like, oh, I could get that row and then design around that. And mm, so it wouldn't yeah. fit the challenge that they do for the row by row but, itself, but you could use that pattern. Yes. I don't so, know. It just seems like they're more popular because of that whole program. I think definitely more awareness. Yeah, exactly. It's out there in the universe. More. It is. People are doing it. Okay. So, yes, I think perhaps there are. But check out uh, the link on Quilt to Check, and we'll have a link to that from our website as well when that goes live. Right. So, first topic, mindful crafting. Mindful crafting. Mindful. Mindful. Crafting. So, do you do mindful crafting? Not really. It's not my jam. See, I think I'm going to argue with you that you do. Dun to dun, because I did some research. Did you Google Just me? like last episode. Okay, and this was the definition that I found out here in the in the in the Google world. In the Googles. In the Googles. <laughs> Mindfulness is they're relating it to meditation. Mm-hmm. And it does not have to be a static activity. You don't have to remain silent and still to meditate. And what they're saying is that mindfulness, meditation, and experience flow impact the brain. Yes. And research shows that these practices improve depression, anxiety, coping style in the face of adversity, improvement in quality of life, and significantly reduce stress. All vital for maintaining brain health and well-being. And I know... It's a lot of woo-woo stuff. I'm just saying. <laughs> no, but I know that you use quilting and that kind of stuff to reduce your anxiety. So because you do that, I think you are doing this, but not necessarily the meditation. So I will say that in the past year and a half, I have seen a change in how I approach the actual doing of the sewing. The doings? The doings, where I'm more easily distracted. Ooh, okay. Phone, computer, all that stuff. So I don't necessarily get into that flow state as much as I used to. Right. And part of that, too, is I got animals and children and and, uh, popping in there. Um, Right. But I think the other part that that does not address for me is the... um, the physical making of things and then the checking off of the I made a thing and I'm done with the thing. That's that's part Which of is your... different from mindfulness. I mean that's yeah, just I a, agree. a feeling of accomplishment. But I think I think the perception is to be mindfully crafting, you're slowing down, you're taking your time. I don't think that that's it. I think it's a it's a more of a focus on the activity. And that it's a repetitive activity. And sewing can be very Cutting can be very repetitive. <laughs> Looking at this thing behind yeah, us. Which we forgot to talk about. <gasps> we did this is um, my hand pieced quilt. Uh, it's called Coffee is Not My Cup of Tea because I don't drink I don't drink coffee. I drink tea. And so all of this is hand pieced. All these blocks are hand pieced. And they're the castle wall block. This is a free pattern on Mickey Dupree's site. Um, That's mdquilts.com. Right. And so I, she, I, I took a class on hand quilting and learned how to do one block and then just didn't stop and kept doing them and went, oh, I have a king size quilt, quilt now. We should stop. But for me, this was very mindful in that it was something I could do that was repetitive. It was 
you were focused on a task. So I think that, and even Albert, and even Albert Einstein, look how smart he was. He's not the end all be all genius, just saying. Well, yeah, but he was pretty smart. Um, he was re- about ladies. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Well, someone taught him to knit because he knitted on projects prior to, um, because he said it calmed his mind and cleared his thinking about the ladies, apparently. And also, he got socks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming he knitted socks. Maybe he just did dishcloths like me or Barbie scarves. He taught at Princeton. Didn't he teach at Princeton? Uh, yeah. I think so, One yeah. of the Ivy League schools, yes. I think it's Princeton because it was in New Jersey. Um, but one of the things that they said, and I think I do this, I do this because I have to admit sometimes when I'm not listening to a show or music or book or whatever, and I'm just sewing, there is something relaxing about that needle just being consistently making that repetitive noise. And I do, and this is who I am. I I do pray. There are some times when I don't want anything else on, and I'm just sewing and praying, and that's kind of my part of my prayer time. And you're not necessarily praying that your points match. No. Okay. Just no. Saying. No. I'm just it's like praying. the old school sign. As long as there are tests, there'll or be prayer worship, in school. <laughs> for me, it's for me, it's for me, it's a worship activity or it's a prayer activity. So I think that this mindfulness is not necessarily meditate like you have to take really slow stitches or anything (laughs) when I first read it I was like I don't do things slow I just but it's that repetitive so you know the reason this topic came up because someone left a comment and asked our perspective on the videos that are very popular now that are kind of the you know sped up smash cut here's my fabric Boom, so this, shoot, and all of a sudden, here's the block. Yeah. And it's compressed the making of a quilt into two or three minutes. Yeah. And you're like, I can't make a quilt in two or three minutes. It's stressing me out. <laughs> but don't you think HGTV did that to me? I remember when my husband and I first got married, and we had, you know, our first house, and we were, HGTV was on, and we lived in the Knoxville area, which is where it started, HGTV started. And so we would watch... You know, whatever landscape, totally landscaping show, <laughs> like we should do that. And then we go to the you know Lowe's or Home Depot, and we'd be like, "What do we need? <laughs> we can do this in an hour, like with no, commercials." No, you can't. That is not how this works. Yeah, I remember being at Lowe's one day and looking around, going, "We just need to go home. We're just spending money. We're not going to do these projects. This isn't. <laughs> we just should go home." And then when Mike announced to me that now I'm not into landscaping, I want landscaping, but I don't want to do the landscaping. And that's a problem. And so I would go out and buy the plants. And then Mike said, you are no longer allowed to buy any more plants unless they come with holes. (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of the worst part and so yeah, now, i think i stopped those. buying plants because they didn't come with holes but you can probably get those holes from like the acme company i've seen them really yeah, yeah. Just... wiley coyote was a professional at those yeah so maybe it even comes with bird seed and some road runners probably all right but this mindful crafting here's the two exercises that they suggest i don't want homework yes you're getting homework gonna show up and talk about quilts okay we're gonna, gonna talk homework. about quilts so the exercise or the thing that they want you to think about is, is this an activity that you're doing that allows your mind to rest? And if it is, then you are participating in mindful crafting. And then, and next question is, after you do this activity for an extended amount of time, you know, like 15, 20 minutes, do you notice a change in your emotional state? Are you more relaxed? Do you have less anxiety? Do you have less stress? I mean, it depends on how it went. Like, <laughs> hit a needle, <laughs> hit a pin and broke a needle. Sew so through a mat. Uh, Sew so through a mat. <laughs> Agree. My points are jacked up. <laughs> break tons of thread. <laughs> this is not stressful at all. Have this deadline, spreadsheets. Have a cat jump up while you're quilting and <laughs> skid, and then you got a big, like, jaggedy part. I will say that for me, this became very mindful. 
because it was the hand piecing. It was the just the slowing down. Now, I will also say that a lot of these blocks were pieced at a prayer time that I attend with some other friends. And um, so like I was piecing while we were talking about. And so that in itself was a very calming, you know, good experience. So this represents a lot of that to me. So hand piecing to me, I think is very mindful. Not just hand piecing, but for me it is. I was kind of glad. I, I didn't know why you picked this you topic. You thought I picked some woo-woo topic. I did. I was like, what is this? Like, <laughs> I had no idea. And then I looked it up. I was like, surprised. I was like, this, I do this. Hmm. I'm, I do this. It's me. This is that me. Guy. I didn't know that guy. So, and I think you do it too. I just don't think you're. No, sometimes it becomes conscious. a lot more sweaty than mindful. <laughs> How does a lot of tugging, a lot of cursing. <laughs> no. Not terribly mindful. Well, you know case. I don't curse it. I know you don't. I say Dagnabbit. Dagnabbit. Son of a biscuit. Son of a pumpkin eater. <laughs> Fudge nuggets. <laughs> Sugar. It's all good times over here. It is. All right. Well, we are going to take a little break, show you guys a closer look at the coffee is not my cup of tea behind us, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. Now, our next topic is ironing versus pressing. Pressing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, what did you learn? What are your opinions about ironing and pressing? Yes. Yes. That is my opinion. So, I don't think I've legitimately ironed anything since 15 years. Really? Yeah. Like you don't iron shirts? I may have and... to iron a shirt because I did a rayon shirt and it's a little wrinkled and I may have to iron that. I don't iron I stuff. That. Yeah. But, so... but I do iron the backs of like backing and stuff. That's not pressed. Yeah, Those are true. iron. So the difference is with ironing, you are moving the iron. Yes. Around the fabric that you are trying to unwrinkle and pressing, you are doing an up and down motion. You're not moving it. And you're not, yeah. So the reason that most quilt patterns are written to tell you to press seams open, because if you do a ironing motion where you're moving the iron while it's in contact with a fabric, you can skew it or stretch it or make it have wobbly shapes that weren't supposed to be there. Yeah. I sewed my seam straight. Why does it do this now? Because you ironed it like this. Yes. And that's why. Yeah. So that's pretty much it, guys. Hope you enjoyed that topic. There you go. <laughs> Thanks for playing. <laughs> no, I have more questions. So oh, <laughs> when you are pressing, because I would agree when I'm making blocks or whatever, pressing is what we're doing. We're not moving it around. I do iron the backs of quilts and maybe, you know, iron a border, a border or iron my binding or something. Um. So, but when I'm pressing and I've sewn a seam and I need to sew the next piece, do you press that open right away or do you sew the next piece or how do you do that? I sew the next piece. You don't always press between every seam? No, I don't want to torture my fabric and light it on fire. Sometimes a finger press will do the trick. Ah. So you have a seam and you just kind of use your fingernail. And like, or or I've seen people use what they call a wooden iron, which is a little stick with, with a flat a, spot on it. With a flat spot, yep, kind of an angle two. on it. I don't. I, I don't have a wooden I iron. I have one, but I always have my finger with me, but not always my wooden iron. It's like an artist. They say you're, the length of your arm stays the same. So when you're judging distance for measuring, you're measuring, you're always doing it this does that make sense? No. You're looking at me like that does no, not make I'm sense. No, I'm just trying to think through scenarios in which the length of your arm would actually change. That's what I'm doing in my head. Oh. <laughs> I haven't come up with any yet, but if I well, do, I'm sure I'll blurt it out later. No, there <laughs> are reasons it would change, but those are traumatic reasons of like yes. war and losing arms. But then you wouldn't stuff. necessarily have your hands still. Yeah. 
that's true. That would not be good. Um, so I don't have a wooden iron. Do you, but do you use starch when you press? Yes. What kind of starch? Starchy starch. <laughs> do you want a brand name? I buy commercial starch. I yeah, have, but there's different kinds. I mean, there's the kind that you can get. I at mix the, myself in a spray bottle. There you go. I, al I also have some of the, you know, you buy the can of the spray starch, but yes, it's, I, I find that to clump a little bit, like the nozzle that gets can clogged burn. easily. Yeah. And it can burn if your iron's too hot. Yes. I use that starch, the can of starch on my long arm to get wrinkles out, <laughs> like our extra wavy borders or whatever. To get your kinda... B cups down to A cups. Yeah. <laughs> down to normal size. Yeah. <laughs> A cup is not normal size, let's be honest. For me, it's not. <laughs> All you need is a handful, then. <laughs> More than that's a waste. We are talking about... Grandma Eddie told me you... that, just saying. <laughs> I don't even want to bring up the next question. We'll do it. Come okay, on. so... Um, but, do you... So, do you... <laughs> how often do you spray, use the spray starch when you're pressing? Uh, do you wait till your blocks are done? I typically like wait till the jump? blocks are done to spray starch. I will do a dry press of the units right in between. I think for me, if I'm dealing with a lot of bias edges, I got a lot of bias. I got, yeah, you do. <laughs> yes, she does. Uh, if I'm dealing with a lot of bias edges, I'm using more starch when I'm pressing true. because pressing. If you iron, you're gonna whack it out of. You know, it'll get uneven. If you're pressing, it tend to you won't tend to do that. But if you use starch, it helps. Yes. And I have done and written some pretty crazy patterns where it's curved piecing with some biased edges. Mm -hmm. And so starch is your friend in those patterns. Yes. So do you use a dry iron or do you steam in your iron? I used to steam a lot more and I got very unhappy with the state of all irons. And yes, I am making a broad generalization. <laughs> irons spit and they are rude <laughs> and they dribble on things. They're generally not good house guests. So I <laughs> now let any moisture come from the spray bottle. Yep, I do too. I, do, I use a dry iron. I don't put steam in it ever. Because I'm with you. They'll they'll leak or they... And I think your irons will last longer if you don't use the steam. Yeah. Let me ask you a personal question. How big are your holes <laughs> on your iron? <laughs> um, I don't know. <gasps> because I don't look at the bottom of my iron, I have one of those Oslo irons that kind of Aliso? stands up. Aliso irons. They will never sponsor us because I can't say it. They will. But Norway might invite us to come visit. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Aliso iron that kind yeah. of stands up. So I don't sit it up and look at it. So I have no idea. So and I've had that iron. By the way, I know a lot of people complain about how quickly their irons die. Mm -hmm. I've had that iron for at least six or seven years. Yeah. And it's great. So it works great. So what I found uh, when it was time for me to purchase a new iron, I didn't pay attention to it because when I went to buy one at the store, and I get mine at a big box store, yeah, they a were lot of people uh, do. a lot of strong security measures about those irons. So they were like zip tied down and you couldn't pick them up and look at them. And iron manufacturers traditionally don't put pictures of the actual plate, plate on there. And I got one that had not just bigger holes than normal, but they were... Um, essentially countersunk, which is a carpentry term, but there was like right. kind of the big dip and then the hole in the middle. And that always caught on the corner, particularly half square triangles and would oh, always catch and like wrinkle it up. And I, I think, eventually had to just put that one away and get a whole new one that had much smaller. Like, that's a donation garage sale. Yeah, I don't much. know. All right. I always use dry. I don't, I'm with you. I use the spray, whatever starch. And there's a lot of good starch companies out mm -hmm. there that you can buy. Um, and I get the big gallon. <laughs> I like it. Um, so pressing is whatever. Oh, towels. Do you use towels when you iron? Only if I'm traveling and that's the surface that I have with me. There is a reason you would want to use towels if... In, or if I'm pressing velvet. Yeah, if you're pressing velvet. There are certain materials that using a towel will help. And also if you're doing applique. If you are pressing applique, you may not want to, you may want to use a towel on top.
so that it doesn't smash down all of your applique. Um, so, but I use towels every once in a while. Not very often. I use a pressing sheet a lot. Yes. And that's the Teflon kind yes. of sheet that you can put yeah. your adhesive from a fusible applique on. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to ruin your actual pressing surface. Right. But I use that too. And I do a lot of um, uh, fusible applique kind of whatever. I will configure it on my pressing sheet, press it to that, peel it off, and then iron it to mm -hmm. the fabric so that I'm not messing with all those little pieces Kind of thing. Yeah. You have to have the right uh, fusible, though, because some of those fusibles will burn out. Or you have to, yeah, you have to let them cool before you peel it off, too. Yeah, that helps. Because if or you, you don't, flap it a lot. <laughs> it'll cool shred it the edge of it. Yeah. Not that I did that with the last thing I just did, but I wasn't patient. Apparently, I wasn't being mindful. Mm. I was <laughs> rushing through it. Do you use a strip stick? I have a strip stick. Um, and for those of you who don't know, it's like a... Um, the profile of it is a semicircle. It's like a quarter round. Or no, yeah. it's quarter round? No, it would be like a half round. A half round piece of wood, dowel. Mm -hmm. Half round piece of wood, dowel, covered with batting and then some uh, muslin. Mm -hmm. And you can buy them in different lengths. And they allow you to press your seams open or iron your seams open, really, Easier and than you just kind doing of wobble it back yeah. and forth to really instead of them being like this, press them like that. Because sometimes even though you think you're pressing your seam open, yeah, it's maybe 175 degrees instead of 180 degrees. Yeah, and so it's still a little bent. Uh, and I actually did a video, I think that's on our Instagram, um, about using. You need to put it on our YouTube. Yeah, channel. we'll put a link to that in the old show notes, Good. and then I'll put it in the old YouTube's. YouTube's, <laughs> the YouTube's, um. Yeah, I I have one, but I don't use it very often because oh, I, I don't I don't press my seams open. Yeah, it's not as helpful for pressing to one side. I press to one side nine times out of ten. It depends on the block that I'm doing. It depends on the block that I'm doing, or it depends on what I'm doing. But nine times out of ten, I press to the side, to the dark. I press to the dark. Exactly. I got a Darth Vader problem. <laughs> It's not really a problem. It's kind of an opportunity for excellence. <laughs> but it's, I, you know, I don't want to put it on my long arm, yeah. stretch it, and pop those seams. Yeah. Not that you will, but if you try to stitch in the ditch, there's nothing to stitch in the ditch to. True. So, and since I do all my own quilting, I, you know. Yeah. So. So what kind of pressing surfaces do you use? Traditional ironing board? Traditional ironing fancy. board. Just a traditional iron. It's stupid expensive because it was a, I think it's wider and a little bit longer than the ones you can buy at the box stores. Mm -hmm. um, and it has a little plate area where you can set the iron, although I never use that. Mm -hmm. um, so that it still stays on and doesn't actually set up. It's got that plate area. Oh, yeah. Um, it used to have a little arm that you could. <gasps> I have the arm. Yeah, mine broke. Oh, I got mine independent because I don't iron on an ironing board per se. Yeah, you do. I have like this giant four foot by eight foot counter essentially. And then I got, uh, I think it's a piece of, uh, not OSB, whatever it is, MDF. MDF. Medium density fiber board for those there you playing, go. paying attention. Uh, Another and got, three letter acronym. I do love a TLA. Uh, and it's got a coat. Uh, layer batting, and then a layer of that metallic ironing board fabric that you can get at a big right. box fabric retailer. Uh, and then I get to change out, uh, especially when the cover gets gunky. <laughs> Mine's gunky. I need to change. To, uh, layer of fabric there. And so that total is about four foot by 30 inches, I think. Oh, that's nice. It's a nice big one. Except you think it's not as nice as it could be because then I've got like my starch sitting there and then I've got here's a pile of blocks and then there's creep and a cat. And so, yeah. Yeah. It's not... I was noticing, I was taking pictures of a project, you know, we take pictures of projects that we do, and I was taking a picture of something, and I was at the ironing board, I was like, oh, maybe I should change my iron <laughs> surface, because it's got all the kind of stains on it. It's not ripped or anything, but it's got the like water spots. Yeah. And, and then there's, there's like spot, threads stuck yeah. to it. Yeah, there's threads stuck to it. I'm like, oh, it's starting to look a little ratty, maybe I should So when you go on retreat... Up. Do you have like a small portable iron yes, surface? Yes, I do. I do. I have one of those tables that you hook on to yeah. 
I think they went out of business. No. Yeah, I haven't been able to find them whenever we've talked about them before, but it's essentially an ironing board that's about 18 inches wide by two feet. But I tell you what, yes, it is. And it hooks up to a table and it's great. But let me say that for a Christmas present last year, a friend of mine made for our little B group, all of us got little ironing stations. And what she did is she went to, I think, Goodwill or someplace like that and bought a set of TV trays. And she covered all of the TV trays with the batting and the reflective. And then she covered it with like fabric that would match who we are or whatever. So mine's, of course, painted orange. It's very cute. And it's got Alice in Glass orange print on it. And it folds up. And I use that as an ironing station. Mm -hmm. And that would be easy to travel with because it's just the the weight of a TV tray. Now, it was a wooden TV tray, not mm -hmm. metal. Yeah, don't do metal. Though. Yeah. That's going to... The ones we had eats. growing up were metal, so it wouldn't have worked. But this is... Oh, yeah, we did. We had, like, we the metal the, with the sunken. Yeah, with the sunken thing. It was, like, weird bronze colored with Yeah, flowers. it was black with the... Yeah. Yes. yes, we had... Oh, wow. Same thing. We're getting, we're getting nods, nods in, the, in room. the room. They were all metal. But, no, this one... And you'd knock it over with your TV dinner on, and it would, like, make a very loud clang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your Salisbury steak was done for. <laughs> it's a pound of food. <laughs> the hungry man. Wasn't yes. that the hungry yes, man dinner? Hungry man dinner. <laughs> <laughs> the dessert sucked on those things. <laughs> well, it was like the weird cobbler. It was weird. It was apple. just dumb. It was awful. <laughs> like, hungry man's not sponsoring us. <laughs> Never. No, never. So I And also, you know what? We're okay with that. Totally okay with that. <laughs> now, I also have like a tiny wood board that I use for applique because I can have that set right, right next to me at my sewing table if I plug in a portable iron for that. Yep. And that was a piece of scrap wood, honestly. We got it from our basement, but you could also get that from any kind of store. Right, exactly. And it's probably about eh, 10 inches by 10 inches wrapped in flannel. And that's handy to have like right there. Yes. Well, I know like this border, I don't know if you can see, but the top of the border is paper pieced. And so you have to iron between every mm -hmm. attach paper piecing. You have to iron between each stage yeah. foundation piecing. You need to iron between each stage um, or really press. You're not ironing. You're pressing. Um, well, it's less likely to skew because it does have a paper back. Right. And that. Yep. Thing. Yes. Yes. Um. So I, because I was doing so many of those, this is a king size quilt, so there's a lot of paper piece border there. Um, because I was doing so many of them, I was sewing, turning, iron, sewing, turning, which is good for this workout. Yeah, kind unless of thing. you throw out your back. So then you move it to here. So you're doing it here for so long, and then you move it over here, and then do it. I'm just saying, it would help. I don't know about that. <laughs> so, but I have taken iron. In fact, I'm going to retreat next week, at which will be over by the time this airs. But um, I will take a little ironing station mm -hmm. to have, even though they have irons there. And it's good to get up and walk to the. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if I'm not doing this intricate stuff and I'm just like have a stack of blocks and I'll wait till I'm done with that stack, take them and iron at my ironing board so that you're standing up and now the cool thing about the one we have that clips on is that then you can pretend you're like captain picard at the enterprise yes. and you've got like your full bridge yes and i have two tables so i've got the ironing one and then i've just got the regular one for cutting you make the transformer so like, sound when you set them up yeah it's good autobots go <laughs> autobots go <laughs> So, so do you, now when you go on retreat and you're taking your own personal pressing implements. Yes. Do you take a full size iron? Do you take yeah. a travel size one? I've got a travel size I one. Like I a take. tiny mini one. Like it's a legit iron, but it's only that long. Oh no, mine's bigger. Oh, mine's the Rowenta one that you can buy. Yeah, the handle pops up. Yep. <gasps> Ooh, fun tip. Oh, this is a good tip. I know what you're going to tell. The cement? The cement. Oh, okay. The cement so, is a great tip. So when you are done with your iron and you're packing up, but you're like, oh, shoot, my iron's still hot and I need to pack it up, you can take it outside and set it on a cement surface, like a sidewalk, not an asphalt one, which is the cement. blacktop. Cement. Cement. 
key. And the cement will leach the heat out quicker than just leaving it there to naturally cool down. Yep. It does. It's amazing how fast that works, too. Now, the trick is, of course, that suddenly there's 15 of the same iron out there on the sidewalk, and you got to remember which one's yours. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or that it all of a sudden started raining, and everybody runs out to okay. try to get their iron. Yeah, that happened to me at the last class. I was helping pack up the irons from the class, and I was like, oh, this is hot, so I went and set it outside, and then it started raining. I'm, like, running outside to try to get it. So I hope the guild's iron's okay. Sorry. We won't find out until February. Because <laughs> that's the next class for the guild. Yep. So, anyway. All right. All righty. So, how do you all handle pressing matters like <laughs> ironing? Let us know. <laughs> Leave a comment on our blog or on the YouTube episode. And that's all we have for this episode. Today's show is made possible by Ink and Arrow Fabrics because fabric should be fun. Learn more about them and their fun fabrics at inkandarrowfabrics.com. And don't forget to enter the giveaway for the giant Pixie Dots bundle by November 23rd. Thanks also to Fomori Cutlery, the makers of quality cutting instruments. You can learn more about them at fomoricutlery.com. We'd like to thank 77 Peaches, Big Think Productions, for helping produce the stitch. If you've enjoyed the show, please like, share, and subscribe. The next virtual stitching is today, Friday, November 10th at 7 p.m. U.S. Eastern, broadcast live on our YouTube channel. My podcast, Hip to Be a Square, is out on Fridays on iTunes or Google Play. All those details and more can be found on our website, thestitchtvshow.com. Tune in next time for more quilting chat with friends.